Disclosure. So I, receive, um, I currently receive uh, research supports from uh, government, the NIH, NIID, and the Immune Tolerance Network. I have also uh, some uh, research support from uh, Food Allergy Research and Education, the Washington Research Foundation, and uh, from uh, some um, uh, pharmaceutical um, partners, uh, Regional and Immune, Astellas, and Artis Bio. So again, uh, word of the day is uh, Effector. So, uh, quickly, uh, as you know, allergy is really a heterogeneous disease. Uh, differences uh, can be observed between uh, allergic individuals according to the clinical, clinical manifestation that the patient experienced. Uh, we also observed uh, differences uh, regarding the response to therapy, especially uh, allergen specific immunotherapy. Age is probably a factor, and also uh, the type of allergen you are sensitized. So uh, altogether, uh, it's, um, allergy is uh, unlikely to be a single disease, but rather a series of complex overlapping individual diseases uh, or phenotype, each defined by its unique interaction between genetics and environmental factors. So um, in my lab, we do uh, exclusively uh, human uh, immunology. So uh, we receive a lot of blood from uh, patients with um, allergy, asthma, uh, but not only. We also like having blood samples from non-atopic patients to understand what happened. Uh, sometimes we always ask why we are allergic. In my opinion, the biggest question is why we are not all allergic. Um, so um, with this blood, we try to generate maximum of information. Uh, on average, we will say 10 to 15 ml of blood which seems to be a lot for uh, looking at uh, antibodies, uh, like specific IgE or IgG4. However, for the T cells, you will see that it's really the strict minimum. Frequency are very low. The T cell frequency is very low. And the other thing we like to do is to look at uh, the genomic and transcript profile. So we, again, we try to generate maximum of data from that samples. And why we are doing that? It's because we aim to search for a new diagnostic and therapeutic uh, solution that address current unmet patient needs. So um, one of the goals of getting access to uh, clinical samples is really to take advantage of the biological samples collected from patients with clear clinical outcomes to gain insight into the mechanisms underlying the immune-mediated disease. And as new biomarkers are discovered, uh, we also work to translate this uh, clinical, uh, th this research to uh, uh, clinical and drug development settings. An observe, another objective is to offer a rational to pre-select group uh, of patients with high probability to benefit from subsequent immunotherapy. As you know, uh, allergen immunotherapy worked, but uh, not every patient benefit from that. In food allergy, you will see also a few patients with side effects. So one of our goal is can we predict that before uh, every shot or every uh, approach or immunotherapy, sublingual, et cetera. Uh, and finally, uh, we would like to accelerate the development on, of immunotherapeutic agents by looking at uh, the immune responses 
uh, following patients receiving different uh, immunotherapy. So um, this is the, the, the allergic cascade. And um, in, in my lab, we, we like to focus on the human T cells response, and especially the, the allergen specific T cells. And uh, one of the reasons of, uh, of that is because uh, allergen specific TH2 cells are really at the core of the allergic uh, process in atopic individuals. And the other reason is it seems that change in the magnitude and polarization of the allergen specific T cells are generally considered uh, to represent a key component of the beneficial effect of allergen specific immunotherapy. We are using two different uh, techniques uh, in the lab. Um, again, everything is performed in human. Uh, we, everything will be what we call ex vivo. So ex vivo means uh, right after the blood um, is collected, we try to generate those data. So we don't want to introduce a bias in, their, in the assessments of the, the T cell responses. And we use two tools. Uh, the first one, which is for me the, the best one, it's the, really the gold standard to track uh, allergen specific T cells, is called the MHC class two uh, peptide complex or multimer. So um, it, it, it acts like an antibody. Um, so it's a MHC uh, molecules that you, uh, in which you bind uh, an epitope, which should be a dominant uh, epitope derived from the allergen of interest. And then uh, after uh, enrichment uh, of the tetramer positive cells, we, have, uh, we detect those cells uh, here and we can look by flow cytometry to the profile of these cells. Uh, it's really the best tools. However, you need to previously know the MHC class two, the, the HLADR restriction of each patient before using this approach. And on top of that, you need to know which epitope to bind to uh, a certain MHC molecules before starting this approach. So it worked very well in patients from our clinic because we, we can know this information before. However, in, uh, uh, when we receive samples from clinical trial, it's almost impossible to, to do this work. So in that case, we like to use uh, uh, another approach, which is a functional approach. The tetramer is a direct approach. Uh, the, the CD154, it's a functional approach. Uh, briefly, we stimulate the cells with the peptide, the allergen, or even the uh, extract of interest. Uh, we stimulate those cells overnight, so it's 6 to 14 hours. And um, then uh, we take advantage of the selective upregulation of the CD154, which is also known as the CD40 ligand. And then you see a clear uh, population here that express this molecule. And this is a side-by-side -side comparison using uh, one epitope uh, for the stimulation or for the tetramer. And you see that uh, we have about the same results looking at the two. Big advantage of the 154 assay, it's the fact that you really cover the entire immune response against the allergen. Um, uh, doesn't matter which MHC molecules is involved cover also the entire set of peptide that could be uh, involved too. So we usually use 154 assay in our, in our group. So what we have learned using uh, this technology since 15 years. So one thing when we start, so uh, 15 years ago, I started with uh, the MHC class two tetramer, which was really new in the immunology field as a, a new tool. And um, uh, when you stay in the cells, uh, again, everything is ex vivo. You looked at the tetramer positive cells here, and we use CRTH2. So CRTH2, it's a very, it's probably the best TH2 marker expressed on TH2 cells in human. And uh, it's also known as the receptor of the prostaglandin D2. And when you looked at these two markers, uh, uh, these markers, we observed that if you are allergic, and doesn't matter which type of allergy, here you have alder, grass, peanut, of the smite kite, it's also true for peanut, cashew, uh, pistachio, if you are allergic, you have uh, allergen specific T cells that express CRTH2. If you are non-allergic, uh, you don't have any of these cells. It's really black or white. This is what is shown here. And the other things we observed is uh, the TH2 cytokine are mainly produced by the cells that express CRTH2. Uh, this is a fax plot. We are within the total uh, tetramer positive cells, and you can see that 
IL-9, IL-4 are only observed within the CRTH2+, and IL-4, it's a mixture, but it's dominate, the, uh, domi the CRTH2 plus dominate the IL-4 production. So uh, when we observed that, we were thinking, wow, it's very interesting, but what happened to the non-allergic patient? We all have TH2 cells. Uh, why some patients that have an allergic disease have uh, uh, those allergen-specific TH2 cells, and why the non-allergic patient don't have it? What's the difference between the good cells the good TH2 that we all have, and the bad TH2 that only the allergic patient have. So again, we looked at the tetramer staining, and we, um, at that time, we decided to do an unbiased T cell profiling. So uh, long story short, uh, I did that like 10 years ago. I went to every lab, borrowing uh, each uh, antibodies against different surface molecules. Clearly, no bias. You see that uh, I stained the CD4 positive cells, but I also looked at CD8. We never know. They might express also CD8. So it's really an unbiased approach. And I did that for the tetramer positive cells. And I also did that for the total TH2 cells. And then I plot against each other the, the, the tetramer positive cells that express CRTH2 versus the total CRTH2. What we observed is a lot of features that are shared between these two cells. They are TH2. However, we have observed two markers that were clearly upregulated on the tetramer positive TH2 cells. One of these markers is CD161, which was a big surprise at that time because 161 was discovered as a TH17 marker. And um, uh, I was thinking it was an artifact, so we investigate, and no, it was not an artifact. That's really clear features of the allergen specific TH2 cells. And the, 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 these cells are also what we say, uh, what we call terminally differentiated, so highly mature, because they lose expression of this marker, and especially CD27 and CD45RB are clear markers of terminally differentiated cells. When cells lose this marker, this is forever, which means it's a very good biomarker. So then uh, we decide to see what happened to uh, the five top markers that were differentially expressed. We looked here at mold specific T cells using tetramer, and you can see that in this allergic patient, again, we have always the same features. CD45 RB neg, 27 neg, CRTH2 plus, CD49 D plus, and 161 plus in every mold allergic patient. We did the same thing for uh, peanuts. We observed always the same features of the TH2 cells. We then we move to house dust mite, same story. Um, Timothy grass, Halder, same story. So uh, then we were thinking, can we use those features to define a unique subset in allergic patient? Because um, we have to be honest, the tetramer approach is very expensive. And uh, it's, it's very hard, again, as I said, to put in place in clinical practice. So I was wondering whether just using those features in the total uh, PBMC, whether we can define a unique subset. So we applied this getting strategy. So here, this is an allergic individual. And um, we are within the total memory CD4 cells. So we looked at the CD45 RB negative. Then from this population, we looked at the cells that express CD4090 but lack of CD27. And then within this subset, again, we looked at CRTH2, TH2 molecules, and 161, the unique features. And you see here a clear, distinct subset. And if you use the same getting strategy in a non-atopic, non-allergic, someone with absolutely no history of asthma, eczema, or uh, allergy, uh, you can see here we virtually don't have any cells. And we looked at multiple patients. Again, it doesn't matter which type of allergy you have. Here, you almost, have a, you almost have a clear cut between the allergic patient and the non-atopic, non-allergic individuals. So um, we published uh, this story, and we called these cells the TH2A uh, because it was too long to use the, clinic, the features of these cells. <laughs> Anytime I was giving a presentation, you see um, it was pretty complex. So it's very easy. It's a TH2 cells nothing new, and because it's um, only observed in allergic, atopic, or asthmatic patients, I was thinking that putting an A will make my life at least uh, easier, <laughs> and that's why we call them TH2A. So the TH2A have really unique features compared to the TH2 that we all have here. And again, 
these Th2 A cells really encompass all the pathogenic Th2 cells involved in allergic disease. So uh, since now we have an easy access to the pathogenic Th2 cells from the, the non-pathogenic Th2 cells, we looked at uh, the transcript profile of uh, differences between these two subsets. And um, so this uh, data are from, we made those data in 2013. It was the beginning of the epithelial uh, cytokine story and the key role in allergic disease. And we are very uh, happy to observe that you have here ST2, which is the receptor of IL-33, was highly upregulated on the pathogenic Th2 cells. You have also here IL-17RB, which is the receptor for IL-25. We have IL-5 and IL-9, which are also key features of the pathogenic Th2 cells. And we find uh, one transcription factor, which is PPR gamma, which is always consistently upregulating in the pathogenic T cells. We also have the fatty acid pathway, like COX-2 um, and um, HPGDS, which are involved in the synthesis of uh, prostaglandin D2, which is, uh, seems to be uh, unique to the, the pathogenic cells. So um, then this is uh, uh, worked from uh, Justine Calise. She's a PhD in my lab. And we decide to understand why the T cells express IL-33 receptor on their surface. So first question was, can allergen-specific CD4s can sense, uh, sense uh, epithelial cytokine? And what's the role of this epithelial cytokine in modulating the human allergen-specific T cell responses? So then I need to go back to a little bit of history. When we published the TH2A paper, um, a lot of reviewers told me, can you look at ST2 expression uh, at the protein level using flow cytometry? And uh, of course, uh, this is something I wanted to do. Otherwise, I felt clearly I, uh, it was not working. And talking to a lot of immunologists, they always told me the ST2 antibodies that are commercially available are not working in human. It worked very well in mouse, but in human, clearly not working. And I was part of this group because when you looked here at ST2 staining, so the tetramer are clearly don't express ST2, but even the total CD4 cells here, you basically don't have any staining. So yeah, I was, yes, I think this antibody is not working. I tried all the commercially available antibodies, nothing worked. And then I had um, a postdoc that joined my lab and instead of using the tetramer, she wanted to use the functional assay, the CD154 assay. And it was the first time we tried this assay uh, together with ST2 expression. This is a side-by-side -side comparison. Here you have tetramer staining. Here you have 154 assay using the same epitope. And you see we have the same uh, features, CRTH2+, 27 neg, 161+ clear features of the TH2A cells observed in allergic patient. This is, uh, we use an elder allergic patient. And what we observe is ST2 upregulation. And you, you can see here, we still don't see any staining. However, the 154 plus highly express ST2. And one, again, one of, one of the features of this assay, it activate the cells. You need to stimulate the cells to have a regulation of 154. So that's why you have CD69, which is a well-known activation marker. You see here, the cells are activated. They express ST2. In that scenario, the tetramer don't activate the cells. It's like an antibody. The cells are 69 neg. They don't express ST2. So then we were, wow, maybe one of the differences compared to the other cells is the T cells need to have a previous TCR triggering to upregulate ST2. And then they might do that uh, in order to respond to the epithelial cytokine when they migrate back to the tissue. These cells are highly specific. They don't need to respond to epithelial cytokine. Only innate cells should do that. So we investigate that option. And again, we came back to the basic story, what happened in non-allergic patients. So now we use 154 assay. This is the DMSO control, so no stimulation. You see nothing. And then when you use peanut peptide, you see non-allergic patient, again, absence of CRTH2, no CRTH2 cells in non-allergic patient, and no ST2 upregulation. However, when we looked at peanut allergic patient, 
the MSO is pretty clean. When you stimulate with spinet peptide, you have a lot of CRT2. This is what I uh, showed you before. And you see ST2. So uh, when we looked at the, all the population, again, the non-allergic, non-peanut allergic patient don't have CRT2 cells. Only the allergic patient have these cells. And that's the same story for the ST2 positive cells. So because of this observation, we were wondering whether only the TH2A cells were those cells that express ST2. So we did these experiments. So uh, here, again, we use CD154 assay. We stimulate those cells with a pool of allergen. This patient was polysensitized, so we use all of them, peanut, pollen, and dust mite. You can see here we have the cells that were activated following this stimulation, 154 plus. And when we specifically looked at these cells that are the allergen reactive cells, you can define three subsets according to CD27 and CRTH2. So in red, you have the TH2A cells, TH2 plus 27 neg. And you can see that uh, ST2 expression was only observed in the TH2A subset. However, here you have the double negative subset. We virtually don't have any ST2 regulation in this subset. And same thing for the CE27 positive cells, no ST2 regulation. Interestingly, we looked again at the non-activated cells from the same tubes. They were also exposed to peanuts, allergen, uh, pollen, and dust mite, but they, they were not activated. Again, we, you have TH2 cells, but these cells don't upregulate ST2. Um, proof, another proof that you need previous stimulation of the allergen specific TH2A cells to have ST2 upregulation. So this is almost, uh, this is a statistical, statistical summary um, looking in a food allergen, um, 154 plus 27 plus. So the cells that don't include the TH2A cells virtually don't have ST2. Only the C27 neg, which are the TH2A, that include the TH2A cells express ST2 and clearly no ST2 expression in the non-activated cells, 154 neg. Same observation for pollen. So it's consistent across different allergens. And again, these cells, uh, ST2 plus, clearly fall into the TH2A subset. These cells express here TH2. They don't regulate 27, and they upregulate 161. So, um, uh, oh, and then we also looked at other uh, molecules. And we observed the same phenomena for the IL-25 receptor. You need to have a previous TCR triggering of the T cells to have a regulation of IL-25 receptor. It's only observed in the TH2A. However, when we looked at the TSLP receptor, we don't see any uh, expression on the T cells. So it seems that uh, the TSLP might be involved upstream in the allergic cascade. And um, I think uh, Steve Ziegler came here uh, a few months ago, and I think he, he also showed that um, uh, TSLP seems to act upstream in the allergic cascade compared to IL-33 or 25, which are probably a little bit downstream. So next question was, what's the role of IL-33 on the T-cell response? So we use again the 154 assay, but um, we stimulate with peanut uh, epitope uh, plus or minus IL-33 during the stimulation. And what we observe, so here you have the raw data that when we, this is the peanut, the CD154 plus, so the total peanut reactive cells. Obviously, you see IL-5, IL-9, and IL-4. However, when you had IL-33 in the culture, we observed that the, 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 the TH2A cells effector function is enhanced. Uh, we have much more IL-5, much more IL-4. Uh, however, no change in the IL-9 production. Same thing when we looked at the non-activated cells, the CD154 neg, no effect. So uh, it's an adaptive immune response. Epithelial cytokines don't have a direct effect on these cells. So this is the statistical summary. But again, uh, we clearly don't have any effect of IL-33 on the IL-9 production. No difference for the IL-13 production. Only IL-5 and IL-4 are modulated by IL-33. And this phenomena only happen, happen to the CD27 negative population, not in the CD27 uh, positive. 
and you, the cells need to be activated. You have here the, the CD154 negative population, no cytokine produce, uh, uh, induced by IL-33. So how we can summarize uh, this uh, part? Crash. <laughs> okay, here we go. So uh, when patient is exposed to an allergen, as you know, it creates a stress to the epithelial barrier. And this stress uh, induces the uh, release of epithelial cytokine. So in our study, we focus on IL-33, but it might be also true for IL-25. We are currently investigating the effect of IL-25 on the, on the T cell response. So IL-33 have a direct effect on the ILC2, the mast cells, and the APC. This is well known, this is innate cells. So when the allergen is captured by the antigen presenting cells, um, it moves to the lymph node where the T cells are differentiated and activated. I just show you that only the activated TH2A cells can upregulate ST2 and following activation, these cells have to go back to the tissue where they, are, they have to do their job. So by going back to the tissue, now they express ST2, they are exposed to the IL-33 and this enhances the TH2 effector response. So in conclusion, we say that um, the expression of effector cytokine by allergen-specific TH2 cells depend on IL-33 cytokine at site of tissue damaged, revealing a tissue checkpoint that regulates allergic immunity. We are now investigating whether IL-25 will provide different flavor to the TH2A cells. We are expecting that uh, IL-25 will uh, increase IL-9 production. So then you the tissue can modulate the type of pathogenic response they want. Uh, and we might observe uh, a differences between tissue uh, skin uh, response versus gut response. Uh, so currently we are investigating that approach. And finally, uh, we decide to take advantage of the unique upregulation of ST2 following allergen stimulation. So this is work that um, was, uh, this is currently performed by Justin Calis, a PhD in my lab, and Lorena Botero, which is an MD that joined my lab recently. So this essay is very simple. We decide to make it, re to make it the, the simplest possible. Um, so we stimulate the cells overnight with one allergen extract that the patient is sensitized or not. So 18 hour stimulation, then we stain with ST2, one antibody. We enrich the ST2 positive cells with magnetic beads. Then we stain with CD4, two colors. And we looked at the CD4 positive cells that express ST2. And if you do that in non-atopic non control, you see nothing. So here in this patient, we stimulate uh, the cells with either peanut extract, um, peanut peptide pool, or we use a pool of pollen. So we mixed a grass pollen, tree pollen extract. You don't see any positive cells, it's really blank. In this patient here, this is um, uh, the raw data uh, from a polysensitized allergic subject. This subject was sensitized to a lot of allergen. Here we mix peanut and walnut extract you see a lot of ST2 positive cells. We, mil we put also milk extract, we see ST2 cells. We put a uh, dust mite extract, again, the same story. Um, if you saw overall, that's the statistical summary. In non-atopic, non-allergic patient, nothing. In allergic patient, you see ST2 expression. And of course, as a control, we decide to also stimulate those cells with infectious disease, infectious peptide, nothing. ST2 is not upregulated. Sorry, uh, quick question with regards to do we, what kind of sensitivities, hypersensitivities did the allergic subject have? Did they already have food allergies? I'm just curious to see. If it's like so, for example, this patient, yes, yeah. he was enrolled as a peanut allergic patient. Okay. And then a uh, physician at Virginia Mason also usually provides us the different allergens the patient might be sensitized with okay. the IgE level. Uh -huh. And uh, we realized that this patient was clearly uh, polysensitized. Okay. So we decide to investigate uh, uh, the difference between those, and which is very interesting because you see here, for example, peanut and walnut helicite a lot of TH2A right. cells. 
right. while dust mite, uh, it's just, it's a little bit, it's not yeah. nothing, but it's a little bit. So we try to see now, that's future work, whether we can predict okay. successful desensitization mm -hmm. and how quickly we can desensitize the patient. Okay. The other things that will be the last part of my talk, mm -hmm. the TH2A are, one, are even the only cells that are modulated during immunotherapy. So uh, if you observe a decrease over time while the patient is on immunotherapy, uh, it might be associated with a clinical benefit. Okay. Okay. And my overarching uh, goal is really to maybe one day avoid to challenge those patients. Okay. My opinion is if you have a patient, you as a physician, you are pretty sure is sensitized. For you don't want to take the risk to challenge him because you are pretty sure he's allergic. It would be nice to have a third tool on top of the basophil, the skin prick test, maybe the, baso, uh, the IgE level, mm -hmm. to have a T cell response. If you observe this type of response, I can guarantee you that this patient during challenge he will react. And you will see why in uh, the next few slides. So at least you, will, uh, you can reduce the risk. And if you have a patient that virtually, that, that look like this, even if IgE 11 and skin prick test is positive, you know that. yes, you will have proof that the risk might be lower and you will probably feel more confident that you can challenge. It don't mean you won't be allergic. You will see uh, food allergies more complex than just teach two cells. However, you will lower the risk of a severe reaction. One last question. What concentration are you using for the peptides? So here the goal is to make it cheaper. Mm -hmm. We think in, for future clinical practice, peptides are very expensive. Um, uh, they can also um, be toxic. Mm -hmm. So here we use uh, the basic allergen extract, that, the okay. same that you are using yeah. for skin prick test. Cool, thank you. Can you separate out the people are gonna have an eczemas response versus people are gonna have an anaphylactic response with this? That's a very good question. And um, currently we are doing a lot of clinical trial uh, for the company that are trying different approach. And because those patients are very well characterized in terms of symptoms, you know, uh, they use the same uh, protocol across the multi uh, hospital. We are hoping that we will learn a lot in terms of uh, side effects or even uh, clinical symptoms following challenge. So that's clearly what we hope we will learn from that. So far, we don't know because uh, it's very hard to gather all this information, uh, especially when it's ongoing trial, usually uh, they want to keep it, you know, until it's unblinded. We are blinded too. But yes, that's my hope. The advantage is most of the, currently most of the assay, IgE, skin prick test, even basophil, looked at downstream response, uh, allergic response. It's always IgE mediated skin prick test, it's mainly the, the mast cells, you know, and a lot of cells on the surface. Uh, IgE, same thing, and basophil is the same thing. The T cells, it's really upstream, and that might be another chance to look at what's going on upstream. The other things that I like, if you have TH2A cells, it might mean that soon you will have IgE because they are upstream. Mm -hmm. So I also hope that if in a kids, very young kids, if I observe these cells, I will uh, ask the parents to follow him with an allergist because his immune response might move toward an allergic feature. So a lot of dreams, we, so far it's just dreams, but um, it's good to dream and maybe I, I mean hope and um, I, I hope a lot from this assay. Again, what I like here, usually when I show, what I show you right now, it's 16 to 17 color flow cytometry. Very expensive, you need highly trained uh, scientists to use this machine. In clinical practice, the FDA will never accept that. So this assay, it's two color. It's even simple, it's more simple than the basophil test, which is three color. Here you need CD4, you looked at ST2, and if you have ST2, you are most likely allergic. If you you're don't, you're just gating for the yeah. scores. And then we might do a little bit more, but at least the minimum okay. is two. Most of people at the hospital have a four color, so we are developing a four color test, but it depends what, if potentially one day is approved, it's great to show to the FDA that maybe two color are sufficient. Um, and this yeah, is clearly the case. you don't have to worry about the compensation. You don't have that's the right? beauty. Yeah. Should you put these two antibody, you put it on the fax, exactly. yeah. that's it. So uh, it's a really a cool assay. So um, for the next, uh, the second part of my talk, um, 
that's why I changed the, the title, my overall title. I will show you that a distinct T helpers uh, subset contribute, also contribute to the pathogenesis of the classically TH2 mediated food allergy disorder. Uh, so this is work that involved a lot of people. It started a few years ago uh, with a few observations that uh, in a few food allergic patients, uh, right now it's mainly in food allergy, don't seem to be true for pollen allergy. In a few food allergic patients, uh, especially if you are more adult, we observe an absence of TH2A response. But those patients are allergic and you will see they react to food challenge. So we were, what's going on there? And um, you will see we find another subset that might be also involved in the pathogenesis. And this is what I will show you now. So it involves a lot of people and a lot of patients. Uh, so it's, it starts with this observation. So um, this is single cell transcript analysis. It's pretty complex, but uh, basically we are sorting the peanut reactive T cells. And we looked at the profile of each cells, one by one. So each uh, colon, yeah, each colon is one cell. Each row is one gene that is statistically uh, differentially expressed. We use uh, five non-allergic patients, nine peanut allergic patients with different IgE level. So this is uh, then it, this is a computer that clusters everybody, uh, all the cells together to see how close the cells could be between each other. And very interestingly, you see that the computer gathered all the cells from health, the healthy control together. You see here all the black dots, cells from non-allergic patients, non-atopic, were clusters all together. When you looked at the profile of these cells, we find a TH1 response. Um, I lost my uh, pointer. Uh, you can see on the blue that um, you have interferon gamma, you have, uh, you have uh, Tibet, um, so uh, uh, clearly a TH1 response. And, debug, ouch, okay, uh, sorry. Okay, so then we find in the allergic groups, in red here, this is all the cells from the allergic patient, you only have a few cells from non-allergic that overlap here, but we observe two things. First, there is a stratification of the patient based on the IgE level this patient has. You see that here, this is the patient, the cells from patient with low IgE level, and here this is the cells from patient with high IgE level. And we find two clusters. Uh, let's pay the attention first to the, the easiest one, this one. This cluster in red gathered all the gene I just showed you for the, from the TH2A cell subset. You have IL-5, IL-33 receptor, IL-25 receptor, IL-9, and you can see that it's mainly observed in patients with higher IgE level. While patients with low IgE, here in red, uh, those genes are mainly not regulated. But interestingly, we found a third cluster. It was not only TH2 cells. We find a cluster of cells that cover every allergic patient, absent in healthy control, and this subset was more, it was difficult to define, but we find a few genes that make us think that it was more related to TH17 pathway. Uh, IL CD200, IL18 receptor have been linked to TH17. So to make sure of that, we decided to go back to the flow cytometry and we looked at the chemokine ex uh, receptor expression uh, within the peanut reactive cells. You, so CCR4, CCR, CCR6 is well known as a TH17 marker. 161 is a TH2A, 27 neg TH2A, CRTH2, TH2A, CXR3, TH1, CXR5, the T follicular helper, and ST2, TH2A. So in this example, you have a clear TH2A high patient. This is a statistical summary for um, a lot of patients. Each dot is one patient. And all those patients were challenged they react to uh, at least uh, 100 milligrams. So um, it's pretty heterogeneous, but overall we observe that yes, the response is dominated by TH2. However, we also observed some TH17. And you have patients, as I told you, that don't have a lot of TH2, and usually this patient here with a low TH2 response 
is the one with a high TH17 response. We virtually don't have TH1, virtually don't have uh, what we call TH0, it's cells that don't express any of these markers. And the T follicular helper, same thing, don't um, really play a role in the pathogenesis. So this is just an example of, this is one peanut allergic patient. He was challenged. And you see here the TH2A cells. However, you also see some CCR6. So at that time, we were thinking maybe those cells co-express these two markers. And the answer is no. They are mutually exclusive. You see the CRTH2 plus here are mutually exclusive from the CCR6 plus. The CRTH2 plus are clearly TH2A, 27 neg, ST2 plus, while the CCR6 plus are mainly, they are less differentiated, 27 plus. They express CLA, which is a skin homing marker, which is also very interesting, and they do not express ST2. This is the statistical summary here. And we observe uh, again ST2 is up on TH2A, not on the CCR6 plus, 25 receptor. They also are, the TH2A are also more susceptible to die, to, uh, they look, they express PD1. So very interesting features. Um, quickly, um, this is what's going on when we looked at the cytokine profile. Only the CRTH2 plus express TH2 cytokine, IL4, IL5, IL13 only observed in the CRTH2+, not on the CCR6+. It was very hard to detect um, a, a cytokine within the CCR6+. We have a trend of more IL-17, uh, but that's the only things we observed. So because of that, we moved to the transcript analysis. We saw the peanut reactive CRTH2+, the peanut reactive CCR6+, from the same patient. We looked at the transcript profile. <coughs> was very easy for this one. Um, the, the TH2A, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the TH2A network was only observed on the CRTH2+, Cata3, IL4, 5, 13, 9, etc. However, on the CCR6+, this is what we observe, a clear TH17 features. War gamma is the transcription factor for TH17. We found IL17 transcript, IL17A, F, we find also IL-22, another features of the TH-17, TH-22. So we might have a role of the TH-17 cells in food allergy, which is something we don't really understand even now. Um, crash again. So you will see on the next slide, hopefully, um, that um, again, we observe a highly heterogeneous response. As I told you, you have patients that only have TH2A cells, and you have a groups of patients that virtually don't have any TH2A cells here. And um, so this is a TH2A high patient. Again, that's a patient with food allergy in which he just follow what we read in the, on the immunology book. It's a TH2 mediated disease. He have a lot of IgE. Is allergic. However, here, this patient is very interesting. No TH2 cells. This is extreme. Uh, here, it's not representative. That's the extreme patient. Usually, you have um, in between response, but this is the worst case scenario or the best case scenario. Uh, the worst case scenario is absolutely no TH2A cells, only CCR6 plus. And this patient, when you challenge him, is allergic. You have a very low IgE level. Usually those patients have like 1K unit. Skin pretest is weird. And you will see usually those patients are also, most of the time, adult. Um, so we decide to clusterize the patient based on the, what we call immunotype. So the type of T cell response elicited by peanut peptide. So the TH2A high groups is a group of patients that have over than 25% TH2A cells within the peanut reactive T cells. The TH2A low groups is patients that have less than this threshold. So a lot of people were asking me, what about, is it consistent? If we use that as a biomarker, it means that if I repeat the same assay without, uh, in the same patient at different time point, without clinical intervention in this patient, I should observe the same phenomenon. 
Otherwise, it's a bias introduced by my assay. And no, it's not a bias. We follow this patient over a year. Uh, this one every um, uh, three, we, uh, three months, this one every four months. You can see this is a TH2A low patient. So this is called river plot. The width of the color depicts one type of response. And um, um, so you can see here that the width of the red color, the TH2A is pretty low for this patient. And you can see that it's the same between TH1, T2, uh, sorry, T1, T2, T3, T4. It's a very low TH2 response against PNET. For this patient, we consider this patient as a TH2A high. You have over than 25% of TH2A. You can see that this is also consistent. Basically, we have the same profile uh, over time. So yes, it's a good biomarker to use. And this is the most interesting slide for me. Uh, right now, we summarize all the patients we have tested in the lab. So these are clearly unbiased because those patients came from maybe from you, from a lot of hospitals across the United States. They were all challenged. They all react uh, to peanut challenged. And um, this is the distribution of those patients according to whether we define them as TH2A low or TH2A high. This is the skin pretest. Absolutely no difference between a TH2A high and a TH2A low. My conclusion here is maybe the skin pretest reflect what happened in the tissue. <coughs> we have to keep in mind that so far our, marker, our biomarker are within the blood. So then you might have some differences between the two. However, when we look at the IgE response, you can see uh, uh, we have a, a statistical differences between these two groups. The TH2A high are the patients that have a high IgE level. The TH2A low are more um, spread across the IgE level. This is the IgG4, which is also very interesting. No therapy here. This is baseline. Those patients are allergic. They never receive any intervention. Um, we observe that the IgG4 have higher level, the, sorry, we observe the TH2A high patient have higher level of IgG4 compared to the TH2A low. And the age, which is also very interesting, the age seems to separate the TH2A <laughs> low from the TH2A high. And I always keep in mind that a lot of studies, EBV, immune, and a lot of different companies, they always start as phase two using patients from five to 55 years old. And at the end, when they can reach phase four, they file in front of the FDA. DBV, I think it's five to 11. Immune is five to 17 years old because they say it is very hard to observe uh, variation in the adult groups. Usually they have a benefit, but it's very hard to observe statistical difference. I'm wondering that it might be also due to the fact that in adults, we have a different type of T cell response. And we think these cells are much more harder to modulate, uh, they are, as I told you, they are um, not terminally differentiated. So they're probably very hard to modulate the immune response in those patients. Do you have any data on the people that have spontaneously desensitized to peanut? And uh, look at their cell markers? So not on peanuts, because it's pretty hard, but we are now starting a study in milk, so very young kids. We would like to see what happened on the kids uh, that uh, at two years old, they were milk allergic. And then let's say at five years old, uh, they are no longer defined as milk allergic patient. Um, so far, we don't know. We don't have those data yet. We are just thinking to run this kind of assay. We would like to understand what's the natural desensitization, if we can call that. I don't know whether we can say tolerance, but uh, you will see why. But um, at least the natural desensitization. Uh, that's a very good uh, question we should address. I expect that those patients uh, move from teach to a high to teach to a low quickly, somehow. So the last part of my talk now is to understand what happened when now patients receive a clinical intervention. So um, I will focus, so we are investigating, we are looking at a lot of different uh, potential immunotherapy uh, from peptide immunotherapy, we have uh, DNA vaccine, we have uh, uh, oral immunotherapy. On pollen, we also looked at subcutaneous versus sublingual immunotherapy. So, um, however, my conclusion usually are true for every type of immunotherapy. So, and it involved a lot of people. 
in my lab, it's, um, we developed a platform in order to being able to look uh, in fresh blood received from US to those type of response. So uh, a lot of people were in, uh, are or were involved in the, in the, the following uh, results. So I will focus on um, the Palisade study. So uh, I was really lucky to um, collaborate with um, people from Amun. We start this collaboration in 2014, even before Amun was created. Um, and um, we, the goal was just to understand what happened during um, AR101 therapy. So I will show you the result for the, from the phase three. So long story short, you, you know probably how it works, but those patients were screened based on uh, IgE level, skin pretest, but also they had to react uh, following uh, a peanut challenge. They have to react to less or equal to, uh, a dose less or equal to 100 milligrams. And all the enrolled patients then receive a biweekly updosing uh, schedule of AR101 uh, until they reach the uh, maintenance dose, which is 300 milligrams. Usually it takes about uh, six months to reach this dose, and then patients have to every day uh, being exposed to 300 milligrams of AR101. So AR101, uh, it's uh, oral biological drugs product with a characterized peanut protein profile for use in oral immunotherapy in subject with peanut allergy. So uh, as you know, it was published uh, two years ago. This is the, 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 the summary of what happened in the clinic. So the primary efficacy endpoint was defined as the proportion of patients that can tolerate a single dose of 600 milligrams of peanut during the exit food challenge. And clearly we observe a huge benefit from this therapy. Uh, you can see that compared to placebo, over than 70, about 70% 70 of the patient are able to tolerate 600 milligrams post-therapy compared to placebo. And uh, over than 50% can tolerate one grams of peanut at the exit visit compared to uh, placebo. So in this study, we looked at um, we looked at two potential biomarkers. The first one was uh, the basophil test, and the second one was our ex vivo peanut specific T cell profiling. So um, long story short, um, this is what we observed um, in those patients at baseline. So uh, in this trial, we also received patients before the screen challenge. So we had the chance to add access to also patients that were able to tolerate 100 milligrams, and they were um, excluded from the study, but we had the blood, so we looked at the basophil test. We call this patient non-reactor. They tolerate the food challenge. Again, it's only 100 milligrams. They might be allergic to higher dose, but we don't know. And then we have the reactor. The first things we observe is the patient that tolerate this food challenge where have a lower basophil sensitivity. This is called EC50. They can tolerate, uh, usually, uh, the basophil react to 100 milligrams. However, uh, in the reactor, the basophil react to less than 10 milligrams of, um, uh, sorry, 10 nanograms per ml of peanut. And uh, similarly, uh, this is the basophil reactivity. So it's the percentage of basophil that are activated following a stimulation. And you see we have a higher CD max uh, observed in the reactor compared to the, uh, the screen failure. Then this is the T cell response. It was also very interesting. Um, in the non-reactor, we observe a phenotype that looks like the one we observe in healthy control. Uh, those cells have a very low frequency of effector T cells, peanut effector T cells. These cells clearly don't express CRTH2 compared to this, uh, the, the reactors. And interestingly, we also looked at the Treg response. We don't, didn't find any differences between the reactor and the non-reactor. This is now the statistical summary between these two groups looking at the two, three key markers, CRTH2, highly upregulated on the reactor. Uh, CD27 is highly downregulated on the reactor. And CCR6, it's, pretty, uh, it's, a, it's a mixture, but it's the, uh, it seems to be upregulated on the non-reactor patient. They crash again. OK. And uh, interestingly, um, we also looked within all the reactor patients whether there was a correlation between the IgE level and the expression of these three markers. 
And you can see that the expression of CRTH2 highly correlates with the IgE level. So again, a key role of the TH2A cells in the pathogenesis of these cells. So for the, the, the next few slides, we, we decide to divide uh, the peanut reactive T cells in, uh, in uh, four subsets, uh, the TH2A uh, here, and then the, the cells that do not express CRTH2 were divided in four clusters according to C27 and CCR6. And I use this color code here. Keep in mind that the TH2A are, will be in orange in our results. So this is what we observe in terms of correlation between the clinical parameters and each subset. The TH2A cells are the only subset that correlate with the IgE level, positively correlate. They also positively correlate with the IgG4 level. Again, we are at baseline before therapy. They negatively correlate with the basophil sensitivity. I mean that the highest is your level of TH2A cells. The lowest will be, or the highest will be your basophil sensitivity, which means that your basophil will react to very low dose of peanuts and it correlates with the TH2A level. And finally, you also have a trend to positively correlate with the number of basophil that will be activated following peanut stimulation. The next slide is too much data for the computer. <laughs> and I will try to summarize everything because it's a lot of data. But long story short, again, we define uh, two clusters, the TH2A high and the TH2A low, based on CRTH2 and CCR6, as I told you. So what we observe is uh, obviously the TH2A high had much more TH2 cells than the TH2A low. Uh, but also more than the non-reactor. But interestingly, even if we cluster the peanut reactors in TH2A low, in terms of frequency, the TH2A low groups still have higher level of frequency of TH2A cells than the non-reactors. Um, that's the key message from this slide. So um, again, looking at the correlation with uh, the basophil test and, uh, and clinical parameters, the TH2A high tend to have a higher sensitivity compared to TH2A low, but statistically higher than the non-reactor. The TH2A high again have higher level of IgE than the TH2A low, higher level of IgG4, and um, no difference in terms of the dose tolerated at the screen challenge. However, we observe much more patients that, um, that react to three milligrams in the TH2A high groups. So uh, in our cohort we, that we receive, we don't receive all the patients from this trial. It was a sub-study, so only a few patients consent. And um, that's the next slide. So, but however, we observe the same in our cohort from this sub-study, we observe the same phenomena as the full study, which is um, no variation pre-post-treatment in the IgE level. We observe a, a little bit of higher level of IgE in the placebo groups at the end of the treatment, uh, even receiving the placebo. It's probably due to the challenge that the patient received. However, IgG4 was clearly upregulated in the active groups post-therapy. Nothing happened in the placebo groups. And obviously, the dose that those patients were able to tolerate after uh, this oral immunotherapy was way higher at the exit visit compared to baseline, and no difference in the placebo groups. So in this context, what we observed, we observed that in patients that receive the therapy had a basophil uh, sensitivity that decreased. The basophil now react to, you need higher dose to stimulate the basophil uh, post-therapy compared to before. However, it's very interesting and might be consistent with the high GE level. In the placebo groups, now the basophil are more sensitive. It might be also due to the two challenges that this patient received, they create much more IgE, which probably increase a little bit the sensitivity of the basophil test. So that's why we observe um, higher sensitivity on the placebo groups. So um, now looking at the T cell response. Uh, long story short, in the placebo groups, no difference in the number of effector peanut reactive T cells at screen visit, end of dosing, or exit visit. It's always roughly the same level. However, in the, um, uh, in the active groups, compared to baseline, we observe a huge, a tremendous 
decrease of the number of peanut reactive T cells in the blood, even at the end of updosing. So after six months of escalation, we observe a decrease of the uh, frequency, and these uh, frequencies continue to decrease um, during the maintenance phase. So huge difference between these two. And of course, we also looked at the Tregs. However, in the Tregs, we observe no statistical difference between pre and post treatment, whatever we are looking at the active or placebo groups. So now, again, you have the river plot here. You remember my five subset that I defined, the TH2A are in orange. This is the placebo groups. This is over time, you have the screen visit, end up updosing, exit visit. You can see here, this is the number of cells, and here this is the proportion, so the percentage. It's clearly flat. No variation over time in the placebo groups, looking at the frequency or the percentage of cells in the blood. However, in the active groups, you can clearly see that even at the end of dosing, the only subset that was clearly modulated by the therapy was the TH2A subset. You can see that the, the orange almost disappear at the end of dosing and continue to go down at the exit visit, while the other subset here, the other color, remain about roughly the same level. So overall, when we looked at the proportion, so again, now it's the percentage, you can see that this change uh, only happened on the TH2A cells, which at the end you have a change in the hierarchy of the cells. Because the TH2A cells disappear, the other subset that have like a survival benefit remain, and then you have a change in this hierarchy. Do you have any data after you stopped dosing them? Next year. Oh. <laughs> I would love to, yes. Um, however, this is, so here, this is peanut. A few years ago with Stephen Durham and the ATN, we've done a study where uh, Steve was comparing sublingual and subcute two years uh, compared to placebo, uh, and then one year discontinuation. His conclusion, if you remember, was two years is not sufficient to have a long-lasting benefit because after one year discontinuation, all the patients uh, lost their benefit. Uh, it was similar to the placebo. We did the same, uh, we looked at almost the same marker. The first two years, while on therapy, the TH2A were clearly mirroring the clinical status of the patient. The placebo was flat. However, after discontinuation, the TH2A came back. So that's why it's a very interesting biomarker because you, you really reflect what happened on the, on the patient. So that, that, that's the, the, study, the story I just tell you, it's published uh, two years ago. It's from Steve Duran and the ITN. So this is the statistical summary, but only the TH2A cells uh, decrease uh, in this subset, uh, a little bit on the C27 neg, but that's mainly heat. Um, so I like to show raw data and how cool it is, because for us, it was very easy to predict who was active and who was placebo. Uh, this is the baseline. This is the exit visit and the placebo. Just pay attention to my favorite marker, CRTH2. You see a lot of cells here, baseline. A lot of cells here, exit, no change. Still allergic. The active groups, a lot of cells at baseline. Look at what happened at the exit visit. Mm -hmm. They are all gone. Um, so that's why we have a high rate of prediction of who's responder, who's non-responder. And this is what happened in those patients, looking at these two groups. Um, the TH2A high at baseline almost disappear, and this patient moved to a TH2A high phenotype toward the TH2A low phenotype. CCR6 remain. That's very interesting. And in the placebo, this patient uh, didn't vary in the immunotype. And finally, I can go quickly, but we decide to also see whether there is a difference between the TH2A high and the TH2A low groups. And look, long story short, I think this is probably the best slide because the other ones are a little bit complex. So you have the TH2A high groups here. Nothing changed on the CCR6. This is the, the, the frequency. Nothing changed on the C27+. Plus. However, only the CRTH2+, plus, peanut reactive T cells, had a tremendous decrease over time. Interestingly, when we looked at the TH2A low, no change on the CCR6, almost no change on the 27, and just a slight decrease of the remaining CRTH2 cells, but no statistical 
difference over time. So it's a big surprise because those patients had a clinical benefit. However, at the T cell level, we don't observe a lot of changes. So uh, now this is the uh, proportion of cells. Again, because the CRTH2 decrease numbers, the level of CCR6 and CC27 plus increase by default. No change in the TH2A low groups, and that's the river plot. Interestingly, when we look now at the IgE level, this is the delta. So we did the, we, the, the delta of the IgE level at the exit visit minus the IgE level at baseline, just to see the differences. So TH2A high or TH2A low groups, virtually no differences between these two. Um, same thing for placebo. It's more uh, heterogeneous in the TH2A high, but no big differences. However, when we do the same thing for the IgG4 level, if you remember the TH2A high patient at baseline, we have the patient with a lot, at least more IgG4 than the TH2A low groups. And still, we observe that the TH2A high groups are the groups that have much more IgG4 following immunotherapy. So we think that the TH2A cells are bad, but after chronic stimulation, they are exhausted and they might also help for the IgG4 production through IL-10 production. We think it's a feedback loop that following chronic stimulation, the cells have to survive. They are pathogenic, they release TH2 cells, and then you stimulate again and again, higher dose. And like every model, like in cancer, the cells, when they could not really remove the uh, allergen, uh, they turn to be exhausted and um, expression of PD-1, CTLA-4, which we observe on the TH2A cells. And most likely we expect that we are investigating, but we think those cells uh, may release also the IL-10 that provide a benefit to the patient, which is very weird because it's a type of cell that is bad and during immunotherapy could be good. But if you stop, they stop being exhausted and they go back to their original feature, which is being bad. So it's a phenomena where that's why that's how I explained uh, how immunotherapy worked in absence of T-Rex because we do not observe induction of T-Rex using these two approach. So um, quickly, that's my uh, conclusion slide. Um, I have a few conclusion slide, maybe in five minutes. Very easy. Uh, we receive blood samples, allergic patient. If we observe this decrease of CRTH2 plus 161 in the peanut reactive T cells or tetramer. It's a good sign. This patient may have an effect. We did that. We conclude that this patient may have a benefit. And yes, this patient was feeling way better. Huge <laughs> difference. No side effect. And when you receive a placebo control, this is what we have. No change over time in this population. This is a very bad sign. This is a placebo. No effect. The patient remains the same. So. Then how we can, so that's my summary slide. Um, we don't really, since 15 years I'm looking at uh, allergen specific T cells, I never really observed T-Rex. Everybody asks me, what about T-Rex, T-Rex, T-Rex? I don't observe these cells. I don't exclude that these cells on the, are on the tissue. This is just to make being politically correct. But I don't observe these cells even on the periphery and I don't think they are there. So how we can explain uh, the mechanisms of allergy? I see allergic disease as uh, a disease due to one pathogen or a few pathogenic cells that the patient can induce. So if you have TH2A cells, you are allergic. If you remove the TH2A cells, you are no longer allergic. Somehow the patient induces a TH2A response against allergen. That's why he's allergic. Doesn't matter whether you have T-Rex or not. So what happened during immunotherapy? I will try to summarize quickly, and I made an animation. You are allergic. You have TH2A cells. And usually those patients have uh, also IgE response that dominate. So then you start to receive the first shot of immunotherapy, or immunotherapy shot, zoom lingual, whatever. So you activate your TH2A cells. So now, uh, in terms of activation, you are here. And those cells now, because they are TH2, they produce um, uh, TH2 cytokine, they expand, they increase, and you observe uh, more IL-4, and in clinical practice, you also observe increase of IgE. It's really well known that at the beginning of immunotherapy, we have an increase of IgE. This is because we activate the cells for the first time. 
Um, and it's also well known that the TH2 cytokine block Treg response. What happens if you continue the challenge? Now you are increasing the dose, you are increasing the chronicity. Now the cells, the, this chronic high dose allergen stimulation rapidly establish a negative auto-regulatory feedback loop to prevent excessive pro-allergic TH2 cells. This in turn drives the desensitization state. So the cells now, as a feedback loop, make their own IL-10, which reduce the IgE level, start to induce IgG4, and then the patient has a benefit. Then you continue the stimulation. And now you induce, uh, so you have a persistent high dose allergen stimulation of the TH2A cells that trigger a selective T cell exhaustion that could be followed by activation induced cell death. That's why we observe that those cells first exhausted, then deleted, they decrease over time, they go to hypoptosis, they stigma IL-10 to slow down. They don't want to die. They want to survive, but it's a high dose chronic stimulation every day, every day, every day. They have to walk. So you feel better because they, the TH2 decrease. They no longer make IL-4. They want to survive. It's an IL-10 production. In clinic, you observe IgG4, you challenge your patient, you feel better. However, you stop your stimulation. So if you continue long enough, Steve Drive said that minimum three years, a lot of people say five years is probably the minimum, at least for pollen immunotherapy. We have no idea for food, but it might be the true story. Immune or even DBV said you have to keep the patch, you have to keep AR101 over, over, over time, until probably in some patient you might completely delete this stage two response and they could not recover. They will be gone forever or at least for a few years. You have a phenotype that look like a phenotype in healthy control. However, if you uh, stop the treatment too early, these, tel these cells will stop making IL-10 and they will go back to these original features, TH2 cells making, uh, helping the IgE production. So I'll stop here, but just to conclude that the next few years will be a critical time for further uh, evaluate the T-cells biomarker, currently showing promise while continuing to utilize advance in high throughput technology and computational biology to help optimize the most promising biomarker. I'll just show you that the TH2A cells really represent a promising companion biomarker, but maybe also a diagnostic biomarker that may prospectively help predict likely response during AIT. And overall, I would like to say that by really working together with the patient, the physician, the scientist, the industry, the, um, the government partner, we can really envision the discovery and or confirmation of several predictive biomarkers in the near futures. I will stop here just to thank all um, my collaborators, which are key to success, mainly those physicians that you probably know, um, uh, Dr. Mary Farrington, Dr. David uh, Robinson and David Jiang. Um, uh, also, my partners um, with Dan Petroni at the Seattle uh, Asthma Research Institute, all PI at BRI, the patient. Sometimes I need 300 cc of blood from those patients. They accept. The major mm -hmm. pharmaceutical uh, or biotech company that also give me access to those precious samples. FAIR, the WRF, and NIH. And also my group, uh, all those people that I already uh, show you the picture, they are really uh, the dream teams to have in the lab. And I don't forget the people uh, at the core uh, and the clinical core that make the link between uh, my lab and the physician to get access to uh, the identified patients, the ITN, business people. And again, the word of the day is Effector. Okay. Thank you. All right.